Welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'll continue the pharmacology series, starting with the basics. Previous video was on the introduction of pharmacology, so make sure to check it out. The link should be right above. In this video, I will give you a good review on pharmacokinetics and thoroughly discuss the different parameters. Make sure to like the video if it's helpful. Also subscribe and turn on your bell notification so you get the alerts for the next video, which will be on pharmacodynamic. So keeping a visualization of the human body in our head, PK can be broken down into two, pharma and kinetic. Pharma means medication and kinetic refers to movement. So it's basically the movement of drugs through the body. Sometimes we refer to it as what the body does to the drug from the time it enters the body till it's excreted. And as we know, drugs can enter the body through several ways. It doesn't matter if the medication is given by mouth, injectable, or suppository, there will be some kind of absorption. This does not apply to intravenous medications since they are given directly into the blood. After any medication enters the body, it has to get distributed into the cells at the site of action. It needs to be metabolized and then excreted. These are the four parameters of pharmacokinetic and are abbreviated as ADME. If PK is what the body does to the drug and all our bodies are unique in its own way, we can conclude that the PK parameters depend on patient-related factors. What I mean is that between grandma and this young man right here, who do you expect to absorb, distribute, metabolize, and execrete drugs more efficiently? It will be him, of course. What about dosing? Would you give a high dose to a frail patient or an overweight patient? No brainer, it will be the overweight patient. Drugs also have properties that can impact the PK parameters. For example, a drug that's acidic may be absorbed faster in the stomach versus one that is basic. Keep these things in mind as we go through the different pharmacokinetic parameters as these will come up. So the first one is drug absorption, which is defined as the movement of a drug into the bloodstream after administration. Now, unless the drug is administered directly into the bloodstream, it would have to cross some membranes before it gets to the bloodstream. And it does this using different methods. The first one is passive diffusion, where the drug will move from an area of high concentration to low. Now, some properties of the drug can impact its ability to cross the membrane. The membrane is lipophilic, so drugs that are also lipophilic can cross easily. Smaller sized drugs can cross easily too. Also, drugs that have a charge have more difficulty crossing over because the charge makes it more hydrophilic instead of lipophilic. Next, facilitated diffusion, also known as facilitated passive diffusion. It is the same as passive diffusion where the drug moves from an area of high concentration to low, but in this case, it gets help from a carrier protein. So here we have the drugs and it will bind inside this carrier protein. The carrier protein would then open up on the other side and let the drugs out. Although active diffusion requires help from a protein on the membrane to move the drugs across, unlike facilitated diffusion, it requires energy also in the form of ATP to do this. This also allows it to go against a concentration gradient, meaning it doesn't only move the drugs from high concentration to low, it can still transport drugs into the blood regardless of the concentration in the blood relative to where the drug is coming from. Finally, in endocytosis, the drug will be transported by engulfment of the cell membrane and released on the other side. This is more common for large drugs since they can't passively diffuse or fit in the carrier proteins. Unfortunately, during the process of absorption, some drugs do get lost and the amount reduces by the time it reaches the bloodstream. This can be due to the pH, blood flow to that area, and enzymatic breakdown while it's making its way to the blood. This can be avoided by administering the drug directly into the blood. So in other words, when you give IV drugs, the patient gets 100% of the dose. With any other formulation, less than 100% of the drug will reach the bloodstream. So this includes injectables given intramuscularly or subcutaneously, transdermals, suppositories, and oral drugs. This whole concept is known as bioavailability, the amount of drug absorbed that reaches the bloodstream. So as you move to the right in these formulations, the bioavailability reduces. So now the drug is in the bloodstream. That brings me to the next PK parameter, distribution. 
This is the process of delivering a drug from the bloodstream into the tissues of the body. Distribution depends on the biochemical properties of the drug and the individual receiving the drug. If there is reduced blood flow to a specific part of the body, then less drug will reach there. Polarity. So the more lipophilic the drug is, the easier it is to cross the membranes into the cells. And also, the bigger the drug is, the harder it will be for it to cross the membranes. The pH of the site of action where the drug is supposed to bind is also very important. If the site of action is acidic and the drug is also acidic, Moving across the membrane would be easy, but if the site of action is acidic and the drug is basic, this will lead to the drug being charged and difficulty crossing the membrane. Depending on the site of action, permeability may be difficult sometimes. So the brain has the blood-brain barrier, which reduces the penetration of certain things into the brain because of how the cells may be tightly joined together. Compared to the liver, which has a lot of junctions in between the cells and membranes, so it allows things to pass through much more easier. In order for the drug to be distributed into the cells, they must be unbound to any proteins in the blood. The unbound or free drug is the one with the therapeutic effect. Drugs must also bind effectively when it reaches the site of action to have the effect. But there are times when the drug will bind to tissues that we don't want, which can lead to accumulation and toxicity. This brings us to the next concept, the volume of distribution, which tells you the propensity of the drug to remain in the plasma or redistribute into the tissues. It is defined as the theoretical volume of fluid into which the total drug administered would have to be diluted to produce the same concentration in the plasma. And there is an equation to represent it, which is the amount of drug in the body in milligrams over the amount of drug in the plasma in milligrams per ml. A drug with high volume of distribution has a propensity to leave the plasma and enter the extravascular compartments of the body. Conversely, a drug with a low volume of distribution has a propensity to remain in the plasma. Volume of distribution is also important when it comes to dosing. When the volume of distribution is high, higher doses of a drug is required to achieve a given plasma concentration. When the volume of distribution is low, lower doses of a drug is required to achieve a plasma concentration. Next, we have metabolism. For this pharmacokinetic parameter, I already have a video on it. The link should be right above, so make sure to check it out. It is one of my best streaming videos. Lastly, elimination. This is the process of removing the drug and its metabolites from the body. There are many ways to excrete things in the body. The primary way is through the kidneys and the biliary system, where the liver will release drugs into the bile, which will then move into the GI for excretion. Just for your information, drugs can also be excreted through your saliva, your sweat, breast milk, and lungs, but it's not too significant. Let's focus on the renal excretion and some of the factors that can impact it. For drug-related factors, the size, polarity, and whether or not the drug is bound to proteins, only the free, unbound drug gets eliminated, and lastly, kinetics of the drug, which we will discuss more next. For patient-related factors, the health of the kidneys, like the clearance, also the blood flow to it, urine pH can promote excretion or reabsorption back into the circulation, and lastly, concurrent use of drugs that may interact with the main drug during excretion. Now, drugs follow some rules during elimination. These are elimination kinetics, which can be first order or zero order. Most drugs are eliminated through first order kinetics, where the rate of elimination is directly proportional to the concentration of the drug. So the more drug you have in the body, the more it will be removed. When we talk about the rate in this case, just think of the milligrams or the drug amounts. So that will change based on the drug concentration. But in this case also, the percentage of drug that's eliminated each time will not change. Example, if you start with 100 milligrams of this drug, now let's say each hour, 50% will be eliminated and this will not change. So this will remain constant every single hour. But if you look at the milligrams, you will notice that that changes every time. So as the amount of drug reduces, the amount of milligram cleared also reduces. Also for first order kinetics, the half-life is constant. This is the time it takes for 50% of the drug to leave the body. So if the half-life was an hour, 
then every hour, 50% of the drug will leave. This makes it easy to predict when the drug will leave the body so we can dose appropriately. Drugs that are eliminated through zero-order kinetics, such as aspirin, the rate of elimination is independent of the concentration. In other words, the amount eliminated each time is independent of the amount of drug in the body. It will be the same milligram each time, but the percentage eliminated each time will change. So if you start with 100 milligram of this drug, each hour, the same amounts in milligrams will be eliminated, but the percentage will change. If a patient overdoses on a drug following the zero-order kinetics, no matter the amount of drug or how long it's been, the body will clear the same milligrams per time. Finally, the concept of half-life becomes meaningless because the drug concentration does not decrease by half with every predictable time interval. And that will be all, folks. If you learned anything from this video, please hit the like button, subscribe, and leave all your comments and questions down below. Next video will be on pharmacodynamic, so make sure to turn your bell notifications on. Also, follow me on Instagram at Pharmacist Academy. Thank you for watching this video, and take care.